Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'm pleased to uh, enter into this debate on a, a matter of critical strategic importance to Alberta, uh, the construction of the Keystone XL pipeline. Madam Speaker, as I said last night in this place during the emergency take note debate on the coronavirus pandemic, uh, we are facing a, a triple crisis in this province. First of all, and most importantly, the public health crisis opposed by the novel coronavirus, uh, COVID-19. And uh, as the Honourable the Government House Leader just uh, indicated last night, we spent uh, the better part of six hours uh, reporting on Alberta's uh, efforts to keep this province safe uh, by preventing the spread and enhancing our health care response uh, to uh, prevent uh, the, uh, the pandemic from affecting more Albertans. I also, however, indicated that we are dealing with a massive global recession uh, with some projections of a contraction in the North American economy of as large as, as, th as one-third. We could see the economy contract by one-third uh, last month, this month, and the second quarter of this year. That would constitute a greater economic downturn than the Great Depression in 1929-1930. And thirdly, we are facing an unprecedented collapse in energy prices to the point where uh, West Texas Intermediate, the key benchmark for our energy, has been trading uh, at or below $20 a barrel and Western Canadian Select at or below $4 a barrel this past week. Uh, Madam Speaker, we have, never, we have not seen prices at that level uh, in, a, in a real, real terms uh, at, at least since Leduc in 1947. It is really actually not possible to overstate the impact that these things will have uh, on the economy of this province and the financial security of Alberta families, on the future of our uh, businesses and, of, uh, and our standard of life. And so, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, we must stay focused on Controlling the pandemic is job number one. However, we must also uh, take action to the greatest extent possible to protect the economy of this province and to prepare for our eventual economic recovery. As I've said, Madam Speaker, that recovery will not start quickly. Uh, let, me be, let me situate the context for uh, the, today's motion and the government's historic investment in the Keystone XL pipeline. Uh, Madam uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, the primary reason for the collapse in energy prices uh, has been a collapse in, in global economic activity and therefore energy demand. However, concurrent with that, we have seen the bizarre spectacle of hostile regimes, dictatorships and autocracies, like Saudi Arabia and Russia, launching a price war over crude oil, which has effectively caused a surge in supply at the same time we are seeing a total collapse in demand. As I've said in this place before, the last time we saw a concurrent collapse of oil demand and surge in oil supply was, not coincidentally, in 1930. Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, there is no secret as to why the uh, Russians, with the world's fourth largest uh, oil reserves, the Saudis with the world's second largest reserves, uh, are uh, refusing to curtail production, to the contrary, are increasing it. They are doing so in a predatory strategy to drive down production here in North America. Let me explain the context. Many of us have, uh, depending on our age, a, a, an awareness or a memory of the OPEC oil price crisis in 1974, when the OPEC uh, Middle Eastern cartel s significantly constrained supply of global oil, which led to a tripling of prices. And, uh, that, Madam Speaker, I think made us, made North Americans aware of how dependent we had become on foreign sources of energy as the feedstock for our modern economy. Uh, the United States 
parenthetically, Madam Deputy Speaker, has spent likely trillions of dollars and made untold sacrifices, in part to provide a de facto security guarantee to uh, OPEC oil producers in the Middle East to maintain energy security as a critical element of functioning their economy. And yet, happily, over the past decade, North America has become energy independent because of two concurrent factors. One, uh, the U.S. shale revolution, which has seen American oil production move from 3 to 12 million barrels per day over the past uh, decade. Most of that un under the uh, tenure of former President Barack Obama. Concurrently, here in Alberta, we have continued, we have effectively doubled our production from two and a half to nearly five million barrels per day uh, in the last uh, decade. And Madam Deputy Speaker, this means that uh, Canada and the United States taken together constitute a, a net exporter of energy. We are now energy independent in North America. But that growth in production in North America is looked upon with great resentment by OPEC and by Vladimir Putin's regime in Russia. They regard this increased production of oil in North America as a threat to their dominant position in global markets. Uh, and so, uh, three weeks ago today, I, I, I must confess, in the midst of this crisis, I'm losing track of time. I think uh, it was three or four weeks ago today. Uh, discussions between the OPEC cartel and Russia in Vienna broke down because Russia refused to participate in a curtailment of supply in the midst of the coronavirus recession crash, crash in demand. They walked away from the table and they did so explicitly because they indicated that they want to use this crisis to punish North America for producing more energy. What they are trying to do is to make North American energy production uneconomic so that that production is shut in and then permanently impaired. There is a fundamental difference between North American energy production and that in OPEC and Russia, which is simply this. Energy production in this continent is done by the private sector, by the market. But the energy companies in OPEC and Russia are either de jure or de facto state-controlled enterprises. So North America, with very few exceptions, is the only place where the market operates in terms of energy production. So in places like Saudi Arabia and Russia, where the state either directly or indirectly backs energy companies, they can draw on the deep balance sheet of those sovereign states and implicitly massive subsidies. They do not have to compete with our producers on a market basis. They have an enormous advantage in terms of their financial depth to drive prices down below the actual cost of production. That's what they're doing. What they're trying to do is to say, we in North America are vulnerable because private shareholders, banks, investors do not have endless balance sheets, whereas the OPEC and Russian producers are state-backed or state-owned and therefore have much deeper balance sheets. So what they're engaged in is a price war to say, and this is and it's based partly on their observation that our costs of production are relatively higher than theirs here in North America. They're higher in the oil sands because to produce oil sands projects requires enormous upfront capital investment, often in the range of tens of billions of dollars. And production in U.S. shale oil reserves requires a constant capital churn, constantly to be drilling a very ca capital inefficient pattern of exploration and production. And so the, the, the Russian OPEC strategy is predicated on 
our industry being more expensive, but also less capable of coping with a uh, absurdly low energy price. And uh, now, Madam Speaker, Madam Deputy Speaker, much of the commentary has focused on the Russian role in this price war as being the uh, primary protagonist. However, and I'm no defender of, of Vladimir Putin, Madam Deputy Speaker, I, I, I was put on the Russian blacklist. Uh, so I'm no defender of Putin's regime. But let me say this, all the Russians have done is to refuse to curtail production, whereas the Saudis are surging production to the maximum capable, to maximum capacity possible, in, and they're encouraging their Arabopic allies to do the same. This has then led to a situation where there are many projections that we will see uh, Brent, which is the most important global oil benchmark, at trading as low as $5 in the second quarter of this year. If that happens, and if the current trajectory continues, we can expect to see Western Canadian Select, which is the price for our uh, heavy synthetic oil that we produce in Alberta, trading at negative prices within three weeks' time. I know that's hard for us to get our heads around, Madam Deputy Speaker. How can you have a negative price for something? Well, I'll, I'll explain that. If there is such an excess of supply over demand that uh, the only thing you can do with your oil is to produce it and ship it to get it off your hands, then you have to pay somebody a negative price to take it off our hands. Our natural gas producers, our dry gas producers know what that's like. They've often faced negative prices in the summertime here in Alberta in recent years. We are very close to being a negative price territory for Western Canadian Select. And here is what that means. Uh, first of all, as, I, as I've said, there, are, there is an armada of oil tankers filled to the gunnels, leaving the Persian Gulf every day, headed to refineries and uh, tanker complexes around the globe including the U.S. Gulf Coast. I just got off the phone with a senator from Louisiana, where, which is home to many of the key refineries in North America to which we sell Alberta heavy crude. And he confirmed that they are within days of total tank tops in their inventories in the U.S. Gulf. Once that happens, we expect the backup to move to the Pad 2 U.S. Midwest refinery complex and tank farms to be at tank tops there. Then the backup will push all the way up into, into Canada, and if the current situation continues, we will have nowhere to ship the energy that is produced. In that scenario, we can expect to see uh, shut-ins of production. They've already begun. I understand uh, from the, minister, the Honourable Minister of Energy that the Enbridge main line, which ships about 80% of our oil out of Alberta, is operating with about 150,000 barrels per day of unused capacity, which is an indication of voluntary shut-ins that have already occurred. We can expect to see wide-scale shut-ins, I suspect initially in our conventional basin, uh, then amongst our conventional heavy producers, then amongst oil sands mines, and eventually amongst in situ sag D, steam assisted gravity uh, drainage producers. If it reaches that latter point, Madam Deputy Speaker, we need to be deeply concerned about the implications for the integrity of uh, those assets, those sag D in situ projects. Because uh, there is uh, a view that turning off production in those uh, projects for a sustained period of time could compromise the reservoirs. And so all of this poses a profound challenge to Alberta's largest industry, to Canada's largest subsector. Uh, let me remind the Chamber that uh, the largest export industry in Canada is 
Alberta Energy, we export $120 billion last year of energy. By comparison, the entire central Canadian audio, auto sector has a value of 20 to 25 billion dollars. Let's put that in, in context here. We are roughly four to five times more important to the Canadian economy, our energy sector, than the Ontario auto sector. 800,000 jobs across Canada depend directly or indirectly on our energy sector. Nearly 20 percent of federal government revenues depend on Alberta's energy sector. Uh, the Canadian dollar depends on, in large part, on our energy sector because it drives the largest uh, export industry. Uh, and I do not need to explain to this House how the Alberta economy, Alberta jobs, Alberta standard of life, our ability to fund health care, education pro and social programs is so inextricably bound up with the future of our energy industry. Now I know there are some who wish that we're not so. They wish that we had never had an energy, energy industry and there are some, and there are some who, who continue to protest against it. I hope that those folks, Mr. Speaker, will take this time to pause and understand the economic, financial, fiscal, and social consequences of a total collapse in our energy industry. Um, they are, I must confess, Mr. Speaker, when, when I began to process what, where we were headed uh, two or three weeks ago, I had some uh, very personally, emotionally, emotional responses to this because I foresee a time of great personal adversity for many Albertans as a result of all of this. All of that, of course, is on top of five years of economic fragility, in part because of the decline in global energy prices in 2014-15, where we saw the average price for West Texas Intermediate fall from $100 to, to $40. But it stabilized, Mr. Speaker, and, and for the past three to four years, we've seen manageable prices in the range of um, roughly $55 to $65 a barrel. And at the same time, the amazingly resilient and innovative Alberta energy sector responded to that price environment by compressing costs, by applying technology, by producing more efficiently, by improving their balance sheets, by paying down debt so that they could better weather a storm such as this. In fact, the average, they've reduced by about 30% the cost of production of an average barrel of Alberta bitumen in the past five years. Remarkable. And most of our companies are now in a position where their break-even price for production is, is, is about $20 a barrel in the oil sands but about $40 all in, when one includes the cost of capital and basic operations. So I don't need to explain to you, Madam Deputy Speaker, the implications of a, uh, that's WTI, of a price at, of WTI in the teens. I frankly do not think it's inconceivable that WTI could go into the single digits as WCS goes into negative price territory. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, in that respect, this is why I, I would once again plead with the national government to do the responsible thing with an extraordinary uh, injection of liquidity to allow this industry, the largest subsector in Canada's economy, to live to fight another day. And I can assure the Assembly that I and my staff, uh, the Minister of Energy, the Minister of Finance, are working hour by hour with our counterparts in Ottawa uh, on such an effort. I can also assure Albertans that we have received extraordinary support from our friends across the Federation, from provincial and territorial governments, you know, virtually every Premier has called me to say personally that they understand 
the uniquely grave challenge that we are facing in this province and that they stand with us and that they support our call for national solidarity for the industry that has done so much, the workers, the women and men in that industry have done so much for this country in recent decades. Madam Deputy Speaker, um, it is because of this crisis that I have begun discussions with leaders of the United States government and Congress, governors and major energy producers about the prospect of a coordinated North American energy policy that would mitigate the damage of the predatory dumping in which Russia, Saudi and OPEC are engaged. Elements of such a coordinated policy could include a coordinated Canadian-US import tariff on foreign oil. I think it's time, Madam Deputy Speaker, for us to stop being Boy Scouts about this. These regimes, regimes with the world's worst human rights records, regimes that murder their political opponents and journalists, human rights activists, regimes in the Middle East that treat women like property and not people, regimes that use energy wealth to spread violence, terror, conflict and extremism and instability around the world. Together, look at it, the Russians and the Saudis recently, each of them were using their energy wealth to engage in a proxy war in Syria, causing the death of hundreds of thousands of innocent people, including women and children. That's what they do with their energy wealth. And now they're seeking to destroy North American energy production, the only place where we develop energy according to market principles in liberal democracies that respect human rights. It's time for us to stop being Boy Scouts. As I've said to leaders in the United States over the past few days in countless phone calls, they spent trillions of dollars offering a de facto security guarantee to the OPEC producers to maintain energy security. And now, what is the gratitude being shown to the United States and to this country? Trying to drive our energy production underground or off the map so that we are no longer energy independent and we are once more dependent on the Middle East. We will not let that happen, Madam Deputy Speaker. And that is partly why I've begun discussions about a potential coordinated North American energy policy. As I say, one of the policy instruments would be import tariffs on this predatory dumping of dictator oil into our market. Another policy that, that we must be open to would be a, a, a coordinated form of production curtailment across North America. We already began the painful process of production curtailment here in Alberta uh, last year under the previous government, a measure that we reluctantly supported to save our industry at a critical time. Uh, but going further on, on, on government mandated curtailment, if the Americans refuse to do so in concert with us would be pointless. And so that is and also why I'm engaged in, in conversations in that respect, as is the Honourable the Minister of Energy. Um, now, Madam Deputy Speaker, having said all of that, we will get through this crisis. There will be great pain. There will be great adversity. Those are abstract words. What concerns me profoundly, personally, is that adversity, that pain will be felt by many, many families and individuals who are barely hanging on and may lose everything. And so, Madam Deputy Speaker, I want to say, as the Premier of Alberta, that this government will do everything, is doing everything within our power to fight for those families, to fight for a future, for this province's economy, and therefore for its largest sector. 
That is why, uh, on Tuesday of this week, I announced an historic investment to ensure the completion of the Keystone XL pipeline. Let me explain. We all know, as Albertans, that much of the adversity over the past five years has been in large part because of the lack of uh, energy infrastructure, egress, or to put it simply, pipelines. We have 178 billion barrels of proven and probable reserves of crude in this province, the third largest such reserves on the face of the earth. Largest reserves, Venezuela, but because of socialism, they're no longer a competitor. Uh, second largest reserves, Russia, excuse me, excuse me, Saudi Arabia, third largest reserves, Alberta, fourth largest, Russia. The Russians and the Saudis, Madam Deputy Speaker, they have no problem building pipelines and getting their energy to markets. The Russians just opened a massive gas pipeline to China. Well, we've been fighting amongst ourselves in this country for a decade on simply getting liquefied natural gas capacity. Uh, the Saudis can put up a pipeline like that, develop a new oil, oil field, they click a finger, they got a pipeline built. We have been locked into a decade-long struggle to build pipeline capacity to, so that we can export th these vast reserves of energy <clears throat> to the United States, across Canada, and around the world, and in so doing to reduce uh, the enormous price differential we have because of our shipping constraints, our limited pipeline capacity. Now, Madam De Deputy Speaker, I've often pointed out that the, re the, pr the primary reason for our inability to build a pipeline has nothing to do with markets and everything to do with politics. We have been targeted for, the, for over a decade by a highly coordinated and foreign-funded campaign of special interest groups on the green left to landlock Alberta Energy. Now, I know that some dismiss that as a uh, uh, bizarre conspiracy theory. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, the folks involved in that campaign, they don't hide it. All of this is out in, public, in the public domain. If people are the least bit skeptical about this, I invite them to go, just do a Google search, Tar Sands Campaign. And within a couple of minutes, they will be able to see one of the key PowerPoint presentations that was made at the Tar Sands Campaign Conference hosted by the Rockefeller Brothers Foundation in New York City uh, in 2008. And they will see a deliberate, systematic, highly coordinated plan to landlock Canadian, the Canadian oil sands in particular, and, and the effect of which is to landlock Canadian energy in general. And why, and how has that campaign been, uh, how, how has it manifest itself? Well, through a relentless campaign of political opposition, legal harassment, civil disobedience, lies, propaganda, foreign money being dumped into Canadian politics for over a decade. I salute the independent and intrepid researcher Vivian Krauss for having done so much to detail this when, you know, you, I got to just go off on a side here, Madam Deputy Speaker. We give the CBC $1.6 billion a year. They don't seem to have been able to use a dime of that to track a foreign funded campaign to, to shut down the largest industry in Canada that produces much of the $1.6 billion they get. It took one single intrepid researcher to do what Canadian, many Canadian journalists refuse to do. But Madam Deputy Speaker, here's the point. Northern Gateway pipeline, approved by the national government, the National Energy Board, after 
a billion dollar expenditure by Enbridge after eight years of work, vetoed by the federal government in 2016, on, based on an election commitment given to organizations like the Tides Foundation. Um, and then Energy East, after a billion dollar investment by TransCanada Pipelines and six years of work, it would have shipped a million barrels of, of Western Canadian crude to the East Coast. It would have represented energy independence for this country from coast to coast, killed by the Trudeau government with the imposition of absurd regulations uh, that were imposed midstream. Transmount expansion. After hundreds of millions of dollars of expenditures and years of effort after NEB approval, federal cabinet approval, tr uh, Kinder Morgan, the project proponent, ultimately walked away because of the political uncertainty created by these organizations that, that were engaged in a campaign of lawfare. Keystone XL, first proposed by TransCanada Energy a decade ago, on which they have invested $6 billion, vetoed by President Obama 48 hours after Prime Minister Trudeau took office in 2015. 48 hours afterwards. Uh, subsequently, and by the way, vetoed, I must make this clear, even after the United States State Department had recommended it twice, uh, on environmental grounds, on economic grounds. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, it was vetoed after a massive pressure campaign led by U.S. hedge fund billionaire Tom Steyer, recent failed U.S. Democrat candidate, uh, presidential candidate, who invested openly over a quarter of a billion dollars in U.S. elections to get a veto on KXL. This is a man, by the way, who made his fortune in gas and oil and, and coal stocks. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, that veto happens, U.S. administration changes, President Trump issues a permit, immediately challenged in court by whom? Members of the Tar Sands campaign, funded by the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, the Hewlett Packard Foundation, the Tides Foundation, and the rest. Four pipelines killed or endlessly delayed by that program. But Madam Dep so, Madam Deputy Speaker, fast forward to the summer of 2019. We were approached by the renamed TC Energy to say that now that they had a second U.S. presidential permit and had resolved outstanding state-level legal issues, regulatory and permitting issues, they wanted to proceed with construction on Keystone XL a project that would ship at least 830,000 barrels of Canadian crude uh, from Hardesty to Steel City, Nebraska, and then onward to U.S. Gulf refineries. Uh, however, TC reported to us that they were unable to secure the capital backing to complete the project. And so, uh, and they said they were unable to because of political uncertainty. Because they were concerned that a prospective change in the U.S. administration would result in an abrogation of the presidential permit. Another example, not of a market failure, but of a political failure. And so we began conversations uh, last August with TC Energy. We engaged uh, world-class financial advisors. I'd like to thank uh, John Prado and his team at TD Securities, as well as McKinsey, uh, the global consulting firm, for having provided us with world-class external advice. I would also like to thank uh, my chief of staff, Jamie Huckabee, for his intrepid and, and brilliant leadership on this file for the past nine months. As they worked through this to establish a transaction that I believe is manifestly in the economic interests of this province and of Albertans, which we announced on Tuesday. It consists of a 
a $0.5 billion Canadian preferred equity share in the, in the Keystone XL project this year, followed by a $6 billion Canadian loan guarantee in 2021 to facilitate TC Energy's access to uh, capital at commercial rates to continue construction. And I'm pleased to inform the House, Madam Deputy Speaker, that after waiting for a decade, after 10 years of delays, that yesterday, shovels were in the ground at 6 a.m. to begin the construction of that pipeline. And I am pleased to inform the House that within weeks, a hole will be drilled between the Manitoba, sorry, to, between the Saskatchewan at Montana border, and that pipe will be put in the ground on the basis of the presidential permit. I am pleased to inform the House that construction will commence immediately on Keystone XL at Hardesty to go to the Montana border, as well as spans in Nebraska and Montana and that pumping stations will be built in South Dakota this year, now, in 2020. That the uh, projected date of completion and commissioning of this project will be in June of 2023. Madam Deputy Speaker, let me be clear. Had we not made this investment, I do not believe the project would ever have proceeded because of the associated, the perceived political risk. I do not, I, I've, as I said on Tuesday, as a free market conservative, I am very skeptical about government interventions in the market. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, this, the, the failure to get pipelines built, as I've said, is not a market failure, it is a failure of policy and of politics. And let me come back to what I was saying earlier. We are in an existential fight for our economic future with state-owned enterprises in hostile regimes. And we must be prepared to use the resources of the state to ensure a future for our largest industry, its workers, and our economy. We will not surrender to their predatory dumping, and nor, Madam Deputy Speaker, will we surrender, nor will we surrender to the foreign-funded special interests who killed Northern Gateway, who killed Energy East, who tr tried to kill Trans Mountain, who caused years of delays on Keystone XL. Our response to all of them, to the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, to the Tides Foundation, to, to the Pembina Institute that has opposed all of these projects, to the Hewlett Packard Foundation, to billionaire Tom Steyer, to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, to Vladimir Putin, to all of them who want to impair and kill our energy sector is that they will not prevail. The government and the people of Alberta will take control of our own destiny in part through the Keystone XL pipeline. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, I can assure Albertans that we have taken every measure to protect taxpayers. There is risk in any project. There's obviously risk. There's risk right now associated with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. However, let me commend TC Energy for uh, having been, this is a, a, a major multinational Alberta-based company, very sophisticated, and they have scrupulously planned for construction this year uh, in a way that com fully complies with public health orders uh, with respect to safe workplaces. Uh, both Alberta, Saskatchewan, North, North Dakota, sorry, South Dakota, Nebraska, and Montana have all declared construction as essential services, have all indicated protocols for the safe operation of construction sites in the COVID-19 environment. Uh, TC Energy has, has for the past three weeks already been quarantining construction crews so they could safely go to work yesterday. And uh, I've spoken to the governors of Montana, South Dakota, and Nebraska, and I want to thank all of them for their support for this project. 
and uh, and 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 they uh, they they are uh, all of those states have protocols in place to ensure the safety of those construction workers, as has TC Energy. So that is that is one short-term risk. There are other risks, but Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm pleased to report that we managed to secure a preferred equity position with our investment. We are at the top of the capital stack, and this effectively means that when the project is complete and commissioned, we anticipate we will plan to sell our shares, and we anticipate making a substantial profit for the Alberta Treasury at that time. We further project, Madam Deputy Speaker, that this project will be responsible for generating an incremental $30 billion in Alberta government revenues through higher shipments of energy, higher prices, by reducing the price differential and higher royalty payments to the Alberta Treasury. $30 billion for health care, for education, for social programs, uh, for our standard of living. Uh, th this year we will build eight Canadian pump stations uh, and 520 kilometres of pipeline in two Canadian spreads, as well as I've said several spreads in the United States. The project this year will create uh, at least 6,800 direct and indirect jobs in Alberta and over 15,000 direct and indirect jobs in Canada. And that is so desperately important right now, Madam Speaker. These are good, high-paying jobs for so many of the people being laid off in the oil field sector right now. They will have an opportunity to work for TC Energy, its contractors, for the little hotels and rest and at least some of the restaurants that can operate along the route, they will have business. Those little towns in, 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 in East Central Alberta, they'll have a bit of a lifeline with this project this year and next year when we so desperately need it. Um, and Madam Deputy Speaker, let me tell the House, let me put this in context in terms of what we're getting. Uh, the Trans Mountain expansion, the federal government and we support them in this, I mean, it, politically, they spent $4.4 .4 billion to buy Trans Mountain. They will have to spend a projected $12.6 billion in construction costs for a project that will ship an incremental uh, 590,000 barrels per day. In other words, the federal investment in TMX represents an investment of $21,000, uh, sorry, $21 per barrel of additional capacity, $21 uh, per barrel of additional capacity. The, uh, I'm going to go back on that, this is 24K, $24,000. The previous NDP government here uh, spent $3.7 billion on crude by rail contracts and was prepared to spend nearly $7 billion to buy the oil that would be shipped to ship what? 120,000 incremental barrels for the mac a maximum of two years at a cost of $31,000 per incremental barrel. But the equity investment plus loan guarantees that we are in, uh, putting in place for the completion of Keystone XL means that our investment will uh, result in uh, $10,700 uh, $10, a barrel per barrel of, of additional capacity. So one half the cost of what the federal government is putting in to K TM TMX, one third the cost of what the NDP was risking on crude by rail. Let me conclude, Madam Deputy Speaker, in saying this. Um, this project tells us that when we get past the price downturn, when global demand recovers, when the inventories come down and prices return to some kind of normal, there will only be a future for our industry. Oh, I have more time. I don't have to wrap up. You have 30 minutes. Okay. The, oh, good. Okay. Excuse me. Then. Yeah. I was shocked to hear your concluding premise. 30 minutes. Um, I'll take. I won't take too much time, Madam Deputy Speaker. I, I just. I needed to explain this part. Um, at some point, at some point, sanity and normalcy will will return to global energy markets. The widespread pr projection is for a rapid V-shaped recovery coming out of the pandemic this summer. Uh, 
of course, there's, there's uncertainty around that. We don't know for certain that, that, that the pandemic will not resurface in the fall as the Spanish flu did in 1919. But the standard economic projection is to see a, a, a very dramatic recovery of global demand and therefore energy consumption beginning in the third quarter of this year. Uh, right now, we see global oil demand in this quarter will, go, will be down 20 to, 30, uh, 20 to 30 million barrels a day. Um, we expect to see 80 to 90 percent of that recovered in the third and fourth quarters of this year. Uh, however, however, the prices will not recover that quickly because of the Saudi Russian dumping, global inventories will be at tank tops all around the world. And it will take, we estimate, upwards of 18 months for, the, for those inventories to decline to a point where the market is back in some kind of uh, stasis, some kind of normal. That is the challenging news. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, when we re return to some kind of normalcy in the prices, there must be a future for our industry. At that point, investment will only return to the Alberta oil basin uh, if we have pipeline capacity. That's why this project is so important. A lot of people may be wondering right now, well, why is the government taking, quotes, a bet on this when prices are at $5 a barrel for Alberta oil? It's a reasonable question. And the answer, Madam Deputy Speaker, is we have to plan for the long term. The, it would be a terrible mistake for leaders at a time such as this to focus only on the hour-by-hour -hour crisis management. A responsible government must plan for the mid to long term. And that's exactly what this investment does. This project will come online, we project, in 2023. At that point, we will be back at something like normal prices. But there will have been great destruction of value and capacity in our energy sector in the interim. We will be in desperate need of an infusion of new capital investment in our energy sector and in new capital investment to create new projects the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers uh, projects that uh, there will be uh, a growth in production in, in, in Alberta that exceeds our takeaway capacity within two years. Now, obviously, the current crisis will, will delay that point. But we will come out of this still with the world's third largest oil reserves, still with, with capacity to produce five million barrels per day, still with the capacity to increase that to six, seven, eight million barrels per day, but we will need a way to ship that. And this is the way to do so. And, and, and so if we want to plan for a future where there will once again be investment back into creating good jobs in this province, that by the way will generate royalties for the Alberta Treasury so we can pay for our social programs, we desperately need a project like this. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, we are hopeful that the Trans Mountain expansion will be completed. And we once again thank the Government of Canada for stepping up to the plate to de-risk that project. And we are working with them to ensure Indigenous uh, co-ownership or financial participation in that important project. But Madam Deputy Speaker, I am not prepared to risk the future of Alberta's economy on that federally owned project. It is essential that we hedge that risk. That's in part what Keystone XL is about. Heaven forbid, heaven forbid the consortium of green left pressure groups succeed in endlessly impeding Trans Mountain's expansion. Should that happen, we will proceed with Keystone XL. We will have adequate production and supply in the future for both of those projects and, of course, the completion of Enbridge's Line 3, we hope later this year. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, this is the prudent thing to do. 
And I will close now by saying not only does this transaction make a great deal of sense in creating jobs in Alberta right now when we desperately need them, not only does it represent a path to the future, and we estimate $30 billion of incremental revenues for the Alberta government, but I think perhaps the most important result of Tuesday's announcement of our investment is this, a sense of hope for the people of Alberta when they so desperately need one. These are very trying times. And I think Albertans desperately need to know that there is a light at the end of the tunnel, that there is a plan for recovery, that there is a future for our largest industry and therefore for our broader economy. And Albertans can now know that with this strategic investment, supported by the people and government of Alberta, that there is a path forward. This is, no, this is not pie in the sky. There are shovels in the ground right now. There is permitting and legal, legal uh, clearance on this project from here to Steel City, Nebraska. We have the product. We have the brilliant workers. We have the innovation. We have the supply. We will now have a pipeline. We have a future, Madam Speaker. That's what this represents. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.